um, my project uh, focuses on the 1970s, a decade that I refer to as late Mao China, a transitional period that includes the second half of the Cultural Revolution era, but also expands into the first few years even after Mao's death. The widespread violence and destruction that defined early years of the Cultural Revolution subsided in the late Mao years of the 1970s, life seemed to have become normalized. Well, we know Harry Kissinger made two uh, trips to China in 1971, and in 1972, Richard Nixon made to China, made a few highly visible stops in major Chinese cities, and initiated a so-called ping-pong diplomacy that led to final formalization of Sino-American diplomacy in 1974. This was the well-known part of the history, right? So the returning of the Americans added much popular interest, marking the beginning of the era of broader and deeper global engagement. The demonized West, the image that had been prevalent in political posters throughout the world period, began to look more human. Together with a pair of musk oxen and two large redwood trees, the legacy of Nixon uh, also included um, some bell bottoms and dark shades sneaking up on some corners of urban China. More colors and variations of shapes were added to street fashion by the middle of the decade. Film and film culture were a critical genre. A number of feature films were made between 1972 and 1976. That is, after much of the film industry had been shut down, since the mid-1960s. And foreign films from the capitalist world, in addition to those from China's socialist brothers and sisters, began to creep into mass consumption and became prominent in the latter half of the decade. And this began the era of what I call the era of listening to films, where film literacy could be achieved without an actual access to the film products themselves. It's a film culture without films. Cinematic sounds filled the auditory space in 1970s China. Screen songs and classic film dialogues transmitted via various sound devices occupied a central position in the socialist visual culture. So that's the 1970s that I depict in my book. China of the 1970s witnessed the heyday and the gradual decline of a socialist visual culture. There was an unprecedented fascination with the visual, and there was a kind of fascination that was often mediated through the auditory. On one level, think about the technology that transmitted sounds and voices was omnipresent and immediately visible. Wired loudspeakers was a crucial technological device in ensuring that centralized sonic waves canvas every single corner of social life. Statistics show that by the early 1970s, up to 70 million loudspeakers have been installed nationwide. The omnipresence of loudspeakers, why, is 70 million a lot? <laughs> the omnipresence of loudspeakers sends cell waves into rural villages, townships, and urban communities. A range of political posters from the era depict how the electromagnetic waves transmit centralized news and how the mini loudspeakers sound in every household. Rare travel logs of Westerners in China of the 1970s often remarked on the omnipresence of the loudspeakers in practically every corner of the living space. They were seen hanging on roofs, on telephone poles, and on treetops. <laughs> Michelangelo Antonioni's 1970 sweeping documentary, Zhongguo, is the pinnacle of such travelogues in the form of a meandering visual narrative. A scene in the film depicts the Shanghai Band, commanded by a loudspeaker that blasts sound waves and echoes that envelopes the entire waterway and the cityscape. Now, the wire loudspeakers were, of course, not the only sound making devices shaping um, what I have called a total soundscape. There was also a network of individually owned sound machines, particularly those millions of tra 
transistor radio sets in popular brand names such as Red Star, Peony, Red Lamp, Red Plum, and Panda, and so on, which were installed inside many private homes and contributed to an all-encompassing network of sounds and waves. To show you the kind of uh, ephemeral material I include in my study, this shows several pamphlets and manuals of popular transistor radio sets from the 1970s. Now there is a marketplace for these things of radio sets and printed ephemera associated with these machines. They're collectibles and can be acquired. There is a marketplace for that as long as you're willing to spend. Right? My basic question, however, remains, where do we locate a body of material that will help reconstruct an archive of sounds and voices? Well, recent decade witnessed a massive effort at constructing an archive of images bearing the distinctive trademarks from the Mao era. Uh, just think, for instance, the good amount of scholarship done on political posters. Um, what has fallen through the crack is a form of ephemeral expression that is much harder to capture. Sounds, voices, noises, silence, that is the auditory. The material is ephemera, and unlike most objects characterized as ephemera that were printed matters, those radio manuals included, auditory expressions were far more intangible and immaterial. Sound has this ephemeral quality to dissipate into the thin air. So historians of sounds have often tried to fight off sound's ephemeral fate by tying them to other and more material forms of expression. So we look at mediation. Sounds medical, non-medical, mechanical bearings, for instance. Sounds and voices mark the ephemeral existence through a process of mediation through discourse of writing, for instance, via the film medium, and by way of a range of so-called sound machines, such as radio, television, and wired loudspeakers. In 1970s China, the predominant form of sound mediation is that of magnetic transcription tape. Cassettes and portable cassette players took roots in China began, beginning in late 1970s and throughout the 1980s. Before then, reel-to-reel -reel audio tape recording already brought about dramatic changes in both radio broadcasting and the recording industry. Sound could be recorded, erased, and re-recorded on the same magnetic tape many times. Sounds could be duplicated from tape to tape with relative ease and a great degree of fidelity. Sound editing was also made easy by physically cutting and rejoining the tape. Magnetic tape was a preferred media in Mao's China for precisely these reasons. It allowed for pre-recording programs and duplication was fast, which made it easy in centrally distributing auditory material in large quantity and with a good speed. In searching for an archive of sounds and voices from the Mao era, I ran into many vinyl records which were better preserved, but most of the time there were reels after reels of magnetic audio tapes. In comparison with the vinyl records, those large reels of magnetic tape are perishables. I call them perishables. Years ago, I witnessed reels after reels of it, mostly recordings of radio programs from the 1960s and 70s, sitting in mold and mildew uh, infested local storage cells. Most of these deteriorated completely or were tossed to make room for the arrival of new media. I was able to locate a few still usable open reels in the local archive but those were all that could be salvaged. The storage space and the content within soon disappeared, making way for future development, an inevitable process that makes some preservation almost an impossible task. Not all was lost. Not everything was lost. There was, clear, there was a clear contrast in what was the perishable and what was to be preserved. So I had said earlier that a general, it was a generational obsession with film culture that was aided by the cinematic sounds that filled the auditory space in 1970s China. 
So a close look at how films were listened to uh, then becomes a meaningful path toward a deeper understanding of cinema's cross-platform hybrid design. Here, I will focus on one key genre that best expresses, best illustrates uh, the expensiveness of film culture at the time, which is the cinematic soundtracks of a handful of films, domestic and foreign, that were reproduced specifically for the purpose of radio broadcasting, and they're called in movie TV, edited film recording. Uh, what I have here is the film Sparkling Red Star uh, in its editory film recording format. And this was produced almost simultaneously as the film itself. Um, one of the most important feature films was one of the most important feature films made between 1973 and 1976. It was a 1974 film. Among these films, Sparkling Red Star stands out as a key text, not only for its narrative appeal to the youngest mouse audience, but also for its cross-platform hybrid design that lends itself perfectly to a sonic amplification suitable for endless circulation on screens, big or small, via printed pages, such as various forms of pictorial art, and through the airwaves, repeated broadcast broadcasting of screen songs in the edited film recording. In the sonic compilation, this edited film recording of Sparkling Red Star, Shan Shan Qi made for radio, produced in the same year that the film was made, a female narrator recounts the narrative and strings together the original dialogues, musical scores, and sound effects. The edited film recording is a thorough rework of the original soundtrack. What comes out is a new product, one that takes crucial pieces on the original soundtrack, but has significant editorial input, specifically in the insertion, in the insertion of an omniscient narrator in pretty much every single editorial recording, there is a very strong voice, the presence of a narrator. The narrator tells the story, expands the narrative at times, and also comes in at crucial moments to drive key messages home. The film production from the very beginning was meant to be also for the consumption at home on gramophone, on radio, and later on television. So much of the auditory material from the Mao era would fit the definition of political ephemera, that is, it was made for immediate use and instant dissemination and became disposable once it had served its function of the particular moment. Most of the reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes that were tossed belonged to that category. Edited film recording, though, had a much longer shelf life. They were played over and over through radio waves throughout the 1970s, became an important component of what I call the total soundscape, and remained till the present as the so-called sound souvenirs. Sound souvenirs, that is, the endangered sounds that were not in the archive, but also remembered. Sound souvenir is a concept we know originally coined by R. Murray Schaefer uh, in his book, The Soundscape, but a host of other later scholars used the concept to further highlight the materiality of auditory expressions. While well, much of the sound production fits in the category of ephemera, such as those quickly deteriorating real-to-real -real magnetic tapes, with careful collecting, archiving, re uh, and rest uh, restoring past sounds can also become physical objects that take a prominent position on somebody's bookshelves. I have here two um, audio. Uh, this is the, the flip side of that final record, Spark from Red Star. I have uh, two audio clips uh, as examples of endangered uh, sounds that have become memorialized, repackaged, and reconsumed in China. And uh, by the end of the decade of the 1970s, the genre of edited film recording entered its last golden age when radio and film audiences alike revered a group of voice artists based in Changchun and Shanghai, respectively, who translated and dubbed a series of foreign films. Walter Defense Sarajevo 
uh, is a former Yugoslav feature made in 1972. It was dubbed into Chinese in 1973 and remained one of the most watched and listened to foreign films in the 1970s. The film was distributed in 60 countries, but it really was in China where it achieved its greatest success, owing a lot to the broad dissemination of the film's auditory representation. So because of these enthusiastic Chinese audience, Walter Defense Story becomes one of the most watched for war films of all time, thanks to the numbers that they crunched in from China. <laughs> Revolutionary legends, enhanced by an exciting action spy story about the Sarajevo underground resistance toward uh, the World War II, intrigued the Chinese audience, particularly the Chinese youth. While the film itself might be seen as an interesting document as to how cinema works to validate social norms and political elections. Its reception in China speaks a different story. By the late 1970s, many Chinese youth could memorize much of the translated film dialogue, not from repeatedly viewing the films, but from repeatedly listening to the edited film reports on radio. Segments of the translated film thus become, became coded language of the time. Urban games would mimic underground resistance forces portrayed in the film and exchange, exchanging secret codes in meetings and gatherings. Destroy fascism. Freedom belongs to the people are two most frequently cited quotes from this and other films that portray underground anti-fascist movement in previously German-occupied East European countries. Knowledge of these secret codes become entry tickets into urban game cultures in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Translated and dubbed film dialogue constructing a wealth of vocabulary nowhere to be found in standard dictionaries of the time. They provide a crucial side in illuminating the intersection between visual and verbal media. Now the audio clip, uh, it's already played. Oh no. Uh, I just on this? Yeah. this audio clip happens at the end of the film. The German officers admitted their futile attempt in locating and exterminating Walter. Walter is the leader of the underground resistance. It's Tito, actually, himself. They ascended to a vantage point overlooking the city of Sarajevo. And, okay. So I just click on that. Okay, thank you. It's not playing the audio clip? Yeah, because you have to copy it. It's embedded in the PowerPoint. If it's not working, I'll play it. The room is small enough. I'll play it from my computer. Okay. Um, officers ascended to vantage point overlooking the city of Sarajevo. One asked who, uh, who Walter was and what he was like. The other pointed to the city of Sarajevo and said, this is Walter. The actual film, actual film with Julie end here, but the radio version does not. It will continue with a female voiceover narrator coming to end to drive the political messages home. Now here's the clip.
今天终于取得了胜利。So, I, how am I doing in terms of time? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm just going to... Um, you have four minutes and 28 before the five minute mark. Oh, okay, thank you. So, voice is recognized as ephemeral. Um, so, voice is um, recognized as, as ephemeral, collected as ephemeral material, is first and foremost rooted in popular culture, I would say. Popular enthusiasm for collecting uh, auditory ephemera pre presents an intellectual dilemma since iconic voices of the time were often shaped by later attempts by amateur historians and untrained, self-appointed archivists from before trained professionals came along. This was the same dilemma with the study of ephemeral film as a particular genre. I think um, some scholars um, have pointed out that the genre of ephemeral film has a popular cultural origin. So the films in their auditory uh, presentations are key texts of the 1970s China, clearly preserved and even memorialized in popular culture. But they still take on the perception as ephemera, as rescue sounds from the dustbin of history. Preserved voices take on the aura of endangered sounds, forever threatening to disappear while being clearly preserved, repackaged, and entering into renewed consumption under the new context. So there's a range of these key texts uh, in this genre, in this uh, the auditory representation of film culture. The transcribed Jane Eyre is my next um, example, is another key text, one that signals the Chinese audience gradual shift from films made in other socialist nations to those from the capitalist world of the West. Statistics of audience participation indicates that while in 1977, films from Yugoslavia, such as World to Defense Sarajevo, were voted as audience's favorite, by 1979, films from England, such as Jane Eyre, Death on the Nile, which was adapted from Agatha Christie's novel, and the 1948 version of Hamlet, starring Lawrence and Livia, quickly rose to be the favorite. So you think about 1970 as a transitional uh, period, things really were shifting so fast, the shifting landscape of 1970, just two years, a switch of foreign film repertoire. Charlotte Bronte's Gothic novel has been adapted for screen presentation many times. For the Chinese audiences, it was Durban Mon's 1970 British production, originally made for television, that captured their imagination. George Scott and Susanna York were the only possible Mr. Rochester and Ms. Zare for the Chinese audience. As for the 1944 production by the 20th Century Fox, starring Orson Welles and John Fontaine, an overwhelmingly favorite version in the English-speaking world, Chinese audiences were dismissed as inauthentic. In the imagination of the generation of Chinese audience, uh, the Chinese viewers and listeners, the transcribed film represents the highest form of the art of voice one that brings out the musical, lyrical, and romantic capacities of the modern Chinese language. And it was Chou Yuefeng and Li Zhu, two of the most beloved voice artists of the 1970s, that materialized these qualities and gave the two characters a renewed life in Chinese mass entertainment of the late 1970s. Chinese audience adorned the film's original soundtrack with its romantically haunting fun filled theme, created by harp, um, piano, harpsichord, and orchestra, a musical score by John Williams. The sound effect is further enhanced by the jazzy and magnetic voice of Chu Yuefeng, who makes George Scott's Mr. Rochester more dark, gloomy, and romantically irres irresistible than all other Mr. Rochesters, and by the silky and elastic tones of Li Zi who turns intricate and strong will this year into a new symbol of China's new moon. Now the clip I have here uh, is the part that Mr. Rochester finally declares his love for this year. Now there is a first person voice over narrator intercepting and annotating the original film dialogue. Uh, that's the final <laughs> <laughs> So, should be okay. 
我现在终于明白，哎，该怎么办去？有这样一个例子，有个年轻人，他从小就被宠爱坏，他犯下个极大的错误，不是罪吗？是错误，他的后果是可怕的。唯一的逃避是逍遥在外，循环作乐。后来他遇见个女人。一个二十年里他从没见过的高尚女人，他重新找到了生活的机会。可是世故人情。